Okay. Hello. Hey, everybody. Um, before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we're on tonight, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Um, we'd like to pay respects to all elders, past, present, and emerging, and acknowledge that sovereignty has not been ceded. I'll now hand over to Taurus. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you so much for braving the rain and spending the evening with us. We're really excited to have our speakers here tonight, and thank you all for being here. Um, and so this is a celebration um, and a collaboration between UNDFEM and Global Hands, and it's a diverse, speakers, um, diverse patient speaker night. Um, our first speaker of the night is Maggie Smith. Um, Maggie is a clinical nurse consultant working at the Albion Centre. She has been working in HIV specialty for 20 years and sexual health for 16 years. Maggie has also been working with the transgender and diverse community for 16 years. In 2019, Maggie co-developed, facilitated and presented a transgender competent care course for primary health clinicians in conjunction with the University of Sydney, the Albion Centre and RACGP. In 2018, she developed and launched T150, the first publicly funded transgender and gender diverse specific sexual health and HIV service. In 2017, Maggie was the international HIV technical advisor for Vanuatu. This involved the delivery of training to healthcare professionals on the Vanuatu HIV treatment guidelines. Please join me in welcoming Maggie. Thank you, and thank you for inviting me here tonight and being interested in transgender health. So, um, and I'm going to try and stay put because I usually wander when I talk, so I'll try and stay close to the microphone. Um, some of you might have some experience dealing with the transgender and gender diverse community. Some of you might have none. This is a very basic 101 in 20 to 25 minutes. So see what we can get covered. Um, your trans 101. Transgender around the world. So being trans and gender diverse um, globally, there are many trans and non-binary identities. They've existed throughout all of history and throughout all cultures. Um, worry, worry lady boys for our First Nations people and, and brother boys, sister girls, um, Fafini Hajari in India. The worldwide prevalence, so how many transgender people are there in the world? Um, Global estimates put anywhere between 0.4 to 0.7. So on average, about 0.6 of the percent of the population will identify as transgender. Um, if you look at the map, you know, you'll go, oh my gosh, there's this exponential increase over the last few years in transgender people. Is it the gender whisperers going into primary schools making all these kids transgender? Probably not. What's happening is hopefully services with knowledge, with a bit more acceptance um, and services, people are actually feeling safer to identify as transgender. For the gender diverse community, so non-binary, getting data on that is near impossible. So trans numbers are still approximated to know how many gender diverse people there are, which is an emerging area. There isn't any data, a, a lot is what I'd say. So what are some of the definitions for trans and gender diverse? Why do I use this term? So. Uh, and trans is an acceptable abbreviation to use, if you hear me say it. Transgender, trans, gender diverse, it's, it's this umbrella term that basically covers all people whose internal sense of their gender differs to the sex they're assigned at birth. It's really simple. Someone who's non-binary, genderqueer, is neither male nor female, so is somewhere in between, may swap in between. Agender, someone who doesn't identify with any gender. AMAB is medical abbreviation, which we use in notes and would be the correct way to document someone who was assigned male sex at birth. AFAB, assigned female at birth. And cisgender is a gender identity for someone who is congruent with the sex they're assigned at birth. So instead of saying you're not transgender, for those of us who aren't trans, we're cisgendered. The reason you hear me say sex assigned at birth and gender identity is very specific. Um, I use these terms because they're the legal terms, especially the use of sex, because you can, and you're all healthcare workers and, doc and doctors here, so you, you, you don't want to offend people. And you can get into some very tricky areas with any population group, the trans community included. So the safest way to go along many paths is to use the, the legally correct term. Mm -hmm. So sex is the term used on a birth certificate, not gender, sex. Gender is a social construct. Does that make sense? Awesome. Everyone's nodding their head. And this is what I was talking about. So basically, when someone is born, a doctor or a nurse comes along, looks at the external genitalia and says, this is a boy or a girl. 
that's your sex. Your gender identity is who you know you are. And a, a person is made up of all these different parts, which we will quickly go through. So your biological sex, that's what I said before. What sex were you assigned at birth? In most cases, based on your external genitalia. And for about 1% of the population, an intersex sex variation. And I'm not going to talk to that because that is not my area of expertise and is a very different area. Your gender identity is who you inherently know you are. It's nothing to do with your anatomy. It's this deeply felt sense that you're a, a boy or a girl, or maybe non-binary. It can often not be visible to others. And that's as simple as it gets. Does everyone understand that? Sex assigned at birth, your gender identity. And if they don't match, you're trans or gender diverse. And it's really simple. People get very confused. This is where it can get confusing. And if you get this, I'll be really happy. So sex assigned at birth, anatomy, gender is your identity. Neither of those determine your sexuality. Your sexuality is who you want to do stuff with, okay? Whether romantically or otherwise, regardless of what bits are going on. And a trans person or a gender diverse person can be straight, can be gay, can be lesbian, can be bisexual, pan, queer, asexual. It's nothing to do with your gender identity, yeah? Someone was assigned male at birth, but they always found women attractive and they were dating women, and they were having sex with women, but while they were doing that, they actually felt like a female. So when they were having sex, their identity to themselves was female. They go through transition, they're female, so once upon a time they were heterosexual in our definitions, all of a sudden they go through their, their, trans, their transition, and they're now identifying as female, they're still attracted to women, so they're lesbian. Does that make sense? Very different things, great, good. And the last one is your gender expression. That's how you present yourself to the world and can once again have nothing to do with all the other threads going on, you know. Should all women wear dresses and skirts and nice heels and makeup, you know, I'd be in big trouble. So basically it's the way we present ourselves to the world. And these can be some of the biggest cues that people take on when they're, they're talking about it. And a pronoun, so using a correct pronoun for a person. So acknowledging they're trans or gender diverse and using the correct pronoun. And basically, it's a word that replaces a noun. So I'm me, they, them, he, his, she, her. So when you're talking about someone else, and if you're first meeting a person, what we do at T150 is for everyone, actually at Albion what we do is ask someone their pronouns. So you don't go, oh, I think this person's trans, I'll see what pronouns. But working in a trans service, the first thing we do is ask, not what a preferred pronoun, but what is your pronoun? I, I identify as male and my pronoun is he, his. So when you're referring to that person, you use the correct pronoun. And it's not tokenistic. Doing that one, like calling someone the right gender, and using the correct pronoun is incredibly significant for a person. And there are little things you can do like that which make a world of difference in getting trust from your patients. So transitioning the journey. And I'm not going to go through all the stages of this or even the medical part of it because that's a whole lecture in itself. But going through transition involves all these different steps. And they're not sequential and it's often really messy and you have, don't have to go through all these steps. Usually the first bit of transitioning, and transitioning is the process of becoming your affirmed gender. Normally the first step is social, is just telling someone, a friend or another trans person, and just starting to feel comfortable in the world. Whether you go on to the other steps or not is determined by a number of things. How a person expresses their gender identity, because we might like to go, you've identified as this gender, you've started to dress that way, you're taking your hormones, you've had surgery, good, you're this gender now. But people don't have to do what we think they should. Not even when you're a doctor and you tell them to, they won't. Um, it's largely up to them. And a lot of it is dependent on many other factors. It's their choice, but also it's expensive. Even taking affirmation hormones can cost quite a bit. Surgery costs a heck of a lot. Sometimes it's their health. They might have a medical condition that prohibits them from, you know, you've got a massive family history of clots and you've had a couple of DVTs yourself. We're not going to be able to give you the same amount of oestrogen we'd like to give someone else to bring about that feminising. So there's lots of factors that play into it. Access to services. Are there any services where you live that can actually provide you with any care? Family support or lack of support from friends and family. Um, and persecution and prosecution which leads into our talks later, but we have a number of clients from countries where if they're seen as even maybe you might be trans, 
have been locked up and bashed daily by police. So, you know, you're not likely to be comfortable in your affirmed gender if you're going to be tortured or killed. And a brief bit for the doctors, and as I said, I can spend a whole lecture on talking about this, but the pharmacology, so um, affirmation hormones. Basically what you're doing when you give someone medication as part of their transitioning is to bring about or maintain the physical changes that are part of the secondary sex characteristics of their affirmed gender. So for a male to female, it's about giving them some estrogen and maybe a testosterone blocker to bring about breast development, lessened body and facial hair, old fat distribution. Um, for a female to male, it's to promote, to promote facial hair body growth. You give someone testosterone, basically. Old fat distribution, increased muscle development. T's a wonder drug. It's amazing. But I do say to the guys when we start them on it, use it for good, not evil. We'll give you testosterone, but if you're going to sit on your bum and eat lots of chocolate watching TV, you're just going to be a fat guy. It doesn't automatically make muscle. <laughs> and there's many different, you don't have to have all these services. At T150, we use what's called... Um, we don't need a signing off from a psychologist or a psychiatrist. We use the, conform, the informed consent model, as you do with many things in medicine. If someone's 18 or over, comes to us, tells us their story and says, I need hormones to become my gender, we take them that they are able to make a legal decision about their own bodies. Um, not that long ago, people would have to go and get signed off by a psychiatrist and go and see an endocrinologist and go through many hoops just to access hormones. Things are starting to change. We always like people to have a bit of either gender support or peer support, someone in place, because the changes are big. It's things people may want to bring about for ages, but there's going to be lots of physical changes and social changes. Oh, and the other interesting thing, and I love telling people this, speech pathologist. So for testosterone, one of the, some changes are permanent, some don't go back and some are temporary. Testosterone lowers someone's voice. For women giving oestrogen has no effect on the vocal cords. So whenever you hear a beautifully spoken transgender woman, it's because she's spent a long time training her vocal cords how to speak. It's purely relearning how you use your voice, which I find is a fascinating thing. It takes a long time. Mental health and the trans community. And what I want to say is I'm going to present you with some quite depressing, ha, want of a better word, facts about mental health um, and social factors there are many resilient and really strong transgender people. They suffer a disproportionate amount of mental health anxiety and depression, but are also amazingly strong and resilient. So not all trans people will go through this. A lot of trans people have had some trouble though. Um, and if you look at these statistics, they're pretty bad. Four times to have been diagnosed with depression, bullying, violence. The statistic at the bottom 50% report a previous suicide attempt. And this isn't a bit of a, oh, I don't feel so good, slash, slash, stay at home. These are hospital, ad whoop, hospital admission suicide attempts. These are serious attempts. So half transgender people in Australia will attempt suicide at least once in their life. And that I find just heartbreaking statistic. And mental health issues don't come about because they're trans. Mental health and depression and anxiety come about because they're trans in a cisgendered world. There's not a problem, there's no inherent problem with being transgender. The problem is they're trying to fit into a world which is set up for a heteronormative, cisgendered world. And if you look at it this way, the social impacts. So if you're excluded and abused and you've got no system, then of course you push out. Whereas the flip side, and it's been proven, if you provide services, if we have a more inclusive society or culture around, there's far less, I know it's not rocket science, far less mental health problems. And the social factors, um, rejection by family and friends. If you look at these, it's hard. Economic vulnerability, higher rates of sex work. And there's nothing wrong, I work in sexual health, with sex work. If someone is choosing to do it, the problem is when people are in a situation, they have no other choice because they're homeless, because they've been kicked out by their family. And, and these are a sequelae of events. If you're young, especially the bottom statistic there. So in Australia, the, the percentage of 14 to 21 year old transgender youth who are, don't have stable housing is 71%. Almost three quarters of trans identifying kids won't have stable housing or be kicked out of home. If you're not in housing when you're a kid or a teenager, it's very hard to go to school. If you can't get, and this is in Australia, this isn't overseas. If you can't get your education, it's very hard to get a decent job. So it's just this ongoing circle. It shouldn't all be depressing. Not all trans people are in this place, but the statistics 
that are not satisfying, I'd say. Challenges with systems. Oh my gosh, medical systems, all systems. Um, Medicare. So we at T150, when someone comes in, registers in their name and if their Medicare card doesn't match the name they use, we ask that once and tell them we need to get it once. But all your billing has to go on their Medicare name. There, there's no work around on it. And it's, it's horrid because it's distressing. So every time a trans person, until they change their name, has to present their Medicare card, they're going to be called what they call dead naming, call the name of their, their former self. Um, we explain it. And if you're Medicare ineligible, which a number of our clients are, you know, you can't get bulk billed or you don't want to present your Medicare card, it causes a lot of problems. Medications can be expensive. Challenges with systems again. Um, do you even have systems? You guys haven't been out and about yet. We use electronic medical records in what's meant to be a trans and gender diverse words for the whole of Southeast Sydney. You have a choice of being male, female or indeterminate. Lovely. So even we collect, so we've got better at going, we've worked this out, how to identify the trans population. We've got nowhere to put it. And it, it, it's one, just offensive, and two, health systems go on data. So if you can't collect any data on the amount of transgender people you're seeing who have these problems, you can't feed it up to the lie because they're going, you don't have any transgender people, we don't have to address the system. Does that make sense? And you end up in the wonderful bureaucratic hellhole that you will all soon experience and enjoy in your medical career. And the bottom one, so the 2016 census was the first time trans and gender diverse people were included on the census, but you had to ring up a special number to make sure you could identify yourself as transgender people because that's not prohibitive. I'm sure they were worried that all of a sudden a whole pile of people would just trans themselves. So the number on the 2016 census is totally inaccurate and a ridiculous system. Challenges with people for the community, most of us are non-judgmental, but people can sometimes say silly things and you've got a community who are so ready for microaggressions and the wrong things to be said, they are hypersensitive. So just try to be careful. And I guess if you're not there, just, just be an ally. You don't ever have to be harsh to a person, but if you hear something a bit dodgy being said, just be an ally and go, hey, let's address this person with a bit more respect. Bad news travels fast. Challenges with clinical space. How do you make somewhere a bit more acceptable? Do you have a, and people who don't know go, what's that? That's the transgender flag. So people know the rainbow flag. Is there a trans flag up? Is there, we have a number of First Nation people, transgender people. So an Indigenous person will spot an Aboriginal flag a mile off. They will. Transgender people will recognise if you've got a trans flag up. I, I know it seems tokenistic, but it's really not. People are hyper aware of these things. And how do you help? I'm going through it so you can ask some questions. You might be able to because this is kind of changing systems. But if you have someone, and even if you can document it somewhere, one, it proves you're interested, and two, it actually helps other clinicians come, come around. What we do is how do you identify your gender? Male, female, non-binary, or other, and select. What sex were you assigned at birth? And if it's on a form, if the two don't match, you can be pretty sure you've got a trans or gender diverse person without going through this awkward, oh, I'm not sure which way they're going or who they are. You have it documented in front of you. And as I said before, the other thing we always ask up, ask up front is what pronouns would they prefer to use? And doing that makes a massive amount of difference to how you can engage with a person. And basically, what else can you do? Oh, Respectful language, ask respectful questioning. The, the transgender broken arm syndrome. If a trans person comes to see you for a broken arm, don't ask about their genitals. And I know it sounds funny, but you'd be amazed with the just inappropriate questions that transgender people get asked by healthcare workers. I've got a cold. Yes, but you have you had reassignment surgery. Nothing to do with it. Um, be, be an ally and an advocate. Oh, and the gender neutral, the great bathroom debate. But we even had trouble at Albion trying to get some of the bathrooms ungendered. Why can't you just put a sign of a toilet on a toilet? Like, what, why do they have to have all the different genders? Just put a sign of a toilet. People know it's a toilet. Um, and that's how you can help. Any questions? I've come in on time, too, that you want to ask? No? About hormones? Anything? Very quiet. No? 
children. No, you would, wouldn't you? Um, we're an over. What would you like to know about kids? Yeah, New South Wales is New South Wales is so far behind both Queensland and Victoria when it comes to trans services, especially paediatric services for transgender. Um, there, uh, no, not official ones, not yet. There's a few services that will see trans kids, um, but not yet. And two years ago, the law got changed. Prior to that, a transgender child, even with family support, was not able to access what's called blocking hormones. So you're not doing any real damage, but you're stopping. The worst thing for a trans kid about to hit puberty is all this stuff kicks in and, and gender dysphoria just goes a whole new step because if you're a guy and you start developing boobs and bleeding, it's like not cool. So to access um, these services is very difficult, but there are hormones you can access to do that. In New South Wales, though, we don't have many official ones you can do. The law changed, so a few years ago, you had to go to the family court. So even if you had your parents' support and the kid identified very clearly they were trans, you had to go to the family court and pay all that money for a judge to go, yes, you're allowed to go and access this service. That changed, but now we don't have any services where the parents can take their kids. And it's, it's heartbreaking. So we have, you saw before what happens when kids aren't at home, you now have some wonderful, passionate parents and families there wanting to keep their kids safe, but in these situations where they can't. Yeah, and that would help a lot. Yeah. Can you specifically Yes. Yep. 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 You just ask everyone. Yeah, it's it's a really good question. And even at Albion, where we're an HIV, so we're primarily MSM service, and bringing that in. So that's not heteronormative, but it was ended up being like homonormative, which is you're now asking this other question about gender, and it like we had a little bit of kickback. But if you ask everyone. It ends up, and it's uncomfortable for, like, as a clinician, it can sometimes be uncomfortable to start asking these questions. You feel clunky. It's just pushing, like, it, if it was just on every form, and I'm an idealist, but especially in health, if it was just there for everyone on admission, it would become standard practice. Does that make sense? You just got to slowly push. Yeah. Yep. Is there a need like that as a That's a very good question. You still, so the DSM, so there's the psychological thing that you don't necessarily have to be dysphoric. It's not a psychological condition, but most doctors will still say there's dysphoria. There actually still has to be a diagnosis for Medicare to accept billing for some of the medication. So, Yes, yeah, it's it's a huge, that one is a great question because it's a big debate that goes on in the community all the time. So you don't have to go and see a psychiatrist or a psychologist and be signed off for it to be a psychological condition, but there's certain billing things that make it helpful just in the way our system's set up. But no, we, we don't need 99.9% .9 of people rock up, you look at them, you go, you know exactly who you are. I'm not going to send you off for another $200 consult for someone to say, yeah, they're fine, give them some estrogen. It's not... It's a good question. You need to be signed off by a psychiatrist before you have um, any sort of top or bottom surgery, though, for reasons I would support as well. Yeah. As a clinician, how do you know that someone is trans or is going to become gender dysphoric in the future? Gender dysphoric having problems with it or, or questioning uh, their... How, yeah. How, how do you know that, it's, that it is at, at that point and that it's not... A phase... Now? No, 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 you're not going to, yeah, please ask. That's what I'm, I'm here for. Um, they identify. Like, you, you, you listen to them. And the sensationalists, and there's a lot in the news at the moment, the Austro like there's, and I won't get political, but there is a lot of anti-trans, especially anti-trans kids stuff going on because the bill's about to be pushed through Parliament, so they're a soft target, but I won't go there. Um, so it's uh, not many people actually go back. So there's this fear that you're going to put, especially kids, on these hormones and alter their lives forever. Sure, a few people, especially adults, might start, like the guys start testosterone and then go, oh, I'm not so sure I'm back off. It, it really doesn't cause that many problems. If you're on T for 15 years, you haven't had periods for 15 years, 
and all of a sudden you go, I want to have a baby, you might have some trouble, but you know, because you have to get the cycles back on. But most people, truly most people when they start, you, you're guided by your, your, your patients, your clients. You will read stuff and there are some articles kind of like the anti-vaxxers about people start and then stop and all this regret from trans kids. It's, it, it's not, they're made up articles. It's not proper science. So it's a good question. Most people know and you go, we're guided by them. Yeah. Yeah. No, I haven't. But I mean, they're, sure, there are. Yeah, absolutely. There's a few. Nori may well be who ended up being the first person to change their birth certificate to non gendered. Nori went through some surgery and they're back, but Nori is a unique <laughs> case. Most people, n no, I, I, I haven't. But yes, of course, there are. There's people who regret. I got some tattoos I wouldn't want to have, but you know. So yes, of course there will be some people who do it, but the majority of people who start are, are fine with their choices. Yeah. Is that it? I'm done. Cool. Thank you. So I know you need to run off early. We have a small gift for you to say thank you. Can we all thank Maggie again? Amazing speech by Maggie. Thank you. Um, so our next speaker is for refugee stuff. Eh? <laughs> and um, it's Dr. Mitchell Smith. Um, he's a public health uh, physician who first worked with refugees in the late um, 1980s in the southern and eastern Asia with humanitarian organizations, including, including MSF. Um, for the past 20 years, he has been the director of the New South Wales Refugee Health Service. As well as managing the service, Dr. Smith provides advice on refugee health policy at local, state and national levels. He teaches students, GPs and conduct, conducts research on refugee health. So please welcome Dr. Smith. Thank you, Hewa. Um, I was just saying to Maggie that as of Tuesday, the 3rd of September, there's going to be an option when patients get admitted to New South Wales hospitals that, where they, they can choose their, um, rather than Ms or Mr or Mrs, it'll be MX, if people wish, apparently. So she hadn't heard that, so that's good. Yeah, I only got the email this week, so we'll see. So that's, that's progress. So that's good. So those big bureaucratic systems can sometimes, um, you know, ch change. Um, Okay, so I'm going to take you on a quick journey um, about refugee women. Um, some of whom may have once been men, been men, and you can imagine what it would be like. And Maggie mentioned persecution, and so you can imagine for someone in, in, in countries where human rights are limited, um, there's enough persecution that goes on anyway. But if you're somebody who is transgender, imagine what that would be like. So, so we so we do have people coming to Australia as refugees based on their um, their yeah on their gender preference, yeah, that's part of it, or, or indeed their sexual preference as well. So, um, and, and you can get refugee status based on those because one of the criteria for refugee status is membership of a particular social group, and so some of those characteristics can, can actually um, be, be relevant. So that's, that's a bit of a segue into, into my talk. Um, and, and, and I did try to get a female, one of my female doctors to come and talk, so I apologise for being male, <laughs> cisgendered. Heteronormative. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I'm a white middle-aged man. Yeah, I know. I'm very privileged, yeah. So, <laughs> but, Jesus, I was born this way, you know. Like, who sang that song? Um, I was born this way, yeah. So um, my daughter dances to it. So I'm going to take you on a little journey. And I, I, I pinched a few slides. I, talk, I gave a talk a few years ago at um, International Women's Day talk. And I said to my lovely mum, who's now in her 80s, I said, I'm talking at International Women's Day. And she said, but you're not a woman. <laughs> yeah, mum, you, thanks. You know, pretty obvious. You should know that. Anyway, but, but I invited her along and I think she was all right. So, um, so what to say? Um, Talking about women refugees doesn't reduce the fact that men and boys suffer 
in refugee settings as well. And in fact, the suffering of men and boys impacts on, on the women who are often the carer, the family carers. You know, and it's often the fact that women refugees have, have lost their men folk who, who are protecting them. And so often part of the vulnerability of women is the fact that they don't have the male protector um, around because he's either dead, missing, in prison, whatever. So, um, and that's certainly the case. And this was a comment made by um, one of uh, a bilingual worker who worked for our service for a while, um, working with the Sudanese community, and that this was something that she'd witnessed in her country. And her husband was a doctor who was killed virtually in front of her, and she had you know, several children that she brought to Australia. And yeah, so that's the sort of experience. And and what we find with women and other refugees, um, and remembering that 50% of refugees are um, women and girls by definition, um, that um, it's often a long term, it's not just say war that suddenly appears and makes people flee, you know, it's often long term persecution that's happened. Somebody who's a minority, part of a minority group and so they've been persecuted for all their lives perhaps and they haven't been able to practice their religion perhaps or they you know, speak their language or, you know, get their, take their kids to the school that they'd like to. So it's often long term persecution and then, that, then there might be an acute thing like a civil war and then people flee and that's how they become, they cross borders and they become refugees. Um, so, um, and, and, and women bear, do bear um, a significant part of the brunt. Um, um, the vulnerability, uh, like other refugees, they're certainly prone to um, mental health impacts, um, physical health uh, issues, lack of access to health services and lack of access to health care. So on top of what they may have experienced, as I said, because that long-term persecution includes poorer access to health care, for example, um, then they become displaced and that poor access to health care continues, ongoing security risk. And just because women might reach a refugee camp, don't think that they're safe then from sexual abuse. And that's going to segue into um, Mary's talk in a moment when she's talking about sexual abuse and, and um, gender-based violence. Um, just because someone's in the camp, don't think... And there are no police in refugee camps. You know, they're not, they're not ordered civil societies like Australia sort of is, um, relatively speaking. Um, yes, the, so there's a lot of disorder and a lot of security risks in, in refugee camps. And sometimes militia end up running those camps the same as they were kind of running things back you know, before people fled. So, so they can be very dangerous situations. And again, for women who are on their own, um, it, it can be even heightened, that risk. Um, believe it or not, that's me, the guy with the beard up there. Up there. Um, with a terrified little baby. So that was working in a tent. So this is a bit about my journey. So I'm a public health physician. That's what I do now. So you as um, studying medicine, one of your preferred um, choices for, for um, medicine can be public health. So that's a, so I belong to a college which is under the College of Physicians. I work as a staff specialist out at Liverpool where I run the New South Wales Refugee Health Service. Um, and I started refugee work back then, a very long time ago, I won't tell you exactly when, um, very long time ago, it was in the 80s, um, and um, that's how I got into, into refugee health and public health, working with, so that was with uh, a, a French, small French organisation, volunteer organisation, um, uh, and we worked under the, the tents in Peshawar in northwest frontier province of Pakistan, where the temperature was sometimes 50 degrees and you couldn't use the thermometer because it was too hot, so that just didn't work. Um, and, you know, that photo reminds me of, so the guy in the middle is actually, a, 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 we were training Afghan medics who then, in Pakistan, who then went back inside Afghanistan because war disrupts health services completely. All the doctors had fled or had been killed or had been drafted into the Russian, you know, Soviet army, which had invaded Afghanistan at the time. Um, and, yeah, so we were training medics who would go back inside Afghanistan and provide barefoot doctor care to the population and to the Mujahideen fighters, it might be said. Um, and then the, mom, the mother there holding her bottle, which is not a great idea, is it? And um, we would have preferred her to be breastfeeding. But providing health care to that woman is really difficult. And in just looking at her, you can immediately start to think some of the barriers that might be present to her health, to her rights, certainly, but also to us um, providing care. And so if I was the doctor on when that woman came in for health care, one, she'd have her husband or brother with her, male, who would certainly not leave her side, certainly not in my presence, 
Um, and two, for me to examine her, well, I remember that the only thing I would perhaps see of that woman was she would lift her veil and I would see her mouth. She would lift her veil like this and I'd see her mouth and I'd be able to look in her mouth. And that's the only part of her I'd be able to eyeball. I wouldn't be able to see her skin or anything else, let alone touch her. So is that good health care? No. Could I do anything else? No, because I was male. So poorer health care because, because she was female. Just wanted to know. And then, and then the other woman there is with a, a child, and you know, it's a reminder about women have you know the main responsibilities for um, domestic chores. You know, and again, if they if they um, if the male head of household is not there, or it makes it more difficult for her, she's more vulnerable. And, mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's um, so that's an Afghan woman. Um, then I went to Hong Kong, which is in the news now, of course. So I worked with Metsa Sans Frontieres in Hong Kong, and back then um, there were Vietnamese refugees sailing into Hong Kong Harbour. And Australia has thought we've had problems. Well, but Hong Kong, very compact um, environment, a thousand refugees a day were sailing into Hong Kong Harbour at that time. The Vietnamese, they were fleeing persecution. Um, yeah, so these are just some images there. But the bottom right hand, um, that's a postnatal clinic, as you might have guessed, uh, that we were running uh, care for um, prenatal and postnatal care for, for women there, as well as general health care, um, immunizations. Uh, and other, other activities in the camps, both detention camps and open refugee camps where people are allowed to go out and work. This, is, this was a detention camp, these women. Um, and for 30 days, I think it is, some of you might know this, 30 days they'd wear these caps to, to keep the wind out of their ears because that was a, a belief of theirs, that to stay healthy, they needed to keep the wind out of their, their ears. So we used to call them contraceptive caps because they'd um, have them on for 30 days and there were, yeah, sexist jokes made about <laughs> their partners not going near them for that time but um, um but um yeah it was a, a very interesting time and but again it was interesting to to see the the women in that environment um but plenty of happy faces and healthy babies which was good so this is a bit old now because there's now more like 62 million people displaced globally um and only around a quarter of those have refugee status so can anyone tell me, I mean, what is a refugee? We're talking about refugee women, but I mean, what's a re what makes somebody a refugee, or as opposed to somebody who's just displaced? To, so obviously they start by being displaced. Does anyone know how do you become a refugee or what a refugee is, what it means? Any thoughts? So if you as a clever medical student, which you all are, were, dis were persecuted, which some people are, and had to leave Notre Dame and go to Queensland, you'd be a displaced person because you're still within your home country, but you're displaced, right? If you then flew to New Zealand to seek asylum, you'd be an asylum seeker. And the New Zealand government would probably accept you, unlike this government. I am getting political. Now, <laughs> now, um, now, so you're an asylum seeker and you're seeking asylum, you're seeking the protection of the New Zealand government and Jacinta Ardern, a wonderful woman, would probably give it to you um, for good reason. If you then were accepted as needing protection, you'd get a refugee status and, yeah, and you'd be resettled as a refugee. Yeah? So it's kind of a continuum, so just so you know. So there's around, pick a number, 10 million, let's say 15 million refugees in the world now. The pr proportion that is settled, resettled annually in a fine country like Australia is less than 1%. Like, it's more like half a percent. It's very small. So when people talk about the queue of refugees, and this is men and women and children, Q, you know, forget it. I mean, it's just, yeah. So, um, yeah, very small percentage groups here. Uh, is anyone aware what's happening in the US at the moment with refugee settlement? Ref US used to resettle 75,000 a year at least. Australia resettles at the moment about um, 18,000 a year, which is quite good. That's the black dot there. See, that number's out of date, sorry. It's gone up to 11, that's good, it's gone up. 11,000, 13,000, it's now 18,000. That's really good. The Australian government doesn't trumpet that. They should. That's really positive. That's our humanitarian resettlement program. It's part of our migration program. And, uh, and there's a separate part of that just for women at risk. It's called the Women at Risk Program. And about 10% of that number is for women who, who are at special risk because they don't, you know, they are on their own or they're not, and they've got children, they're not protected. Yeah? So we get around 1,500 women a year to Australia uh, on this Women at Risk visa. So that's a good thing. But in the US, like it was 75,000, then it went down to 45,000. I think now it's like, I think last financial year, they, because of bureaucracy, they only resettled around 
can't remember, maybe 25,000. And there are people in the Trump administration who want it reduced to like 5,000 or who are pushing for that. So, and that obviously has a big impact on other countries who are trying to resettle and, and on, the, on the world. Anyway, that's an aside. But, so any questions about refugees and how they, the differences? Yes. Uh, yeah, I guess so. Yeah. If you were, yes. Well, not necessarily. I mean, because you might, depending on where you were living. Yeah, like, so you could be living in exile and yeah, not be granted refugee status but still manage to stay there. And then the conditions under which you stay, and this happens to some people in Australia because we, yeah, like we see asylum seekers have been here like 20 years sometimes from places like Fiji and Philippines and Malaysia. And, yeah. Yeah. Um, and they, their living situation is really dire, yeah, because they don't have necessarily formal status. They kind of lose their status. So it would depend where they're living, yeah. So that, that's right, that could happen, yeah. But as Maggie said, it's not all doom and gloom, and, you know, lots of <coughs> most refugees are, um, are very resilient and, um, and come through these, um, these uh, issues really well and... and, and, and arrive in Australia full of desire to contribute to the country, to, you know, to restart their lives, and as you would, as you would be. Um, like other migrants, like most migrants, you know, that's why people migrate. But, but these people have come out of, you know, hellish circumstances, and so they're even more keen to, to kind of restart their lives and, and get going. So, um, yeah, but they can still have significant health issues. Um, so, so, so if this woman was, uh, say, let's say she's a newly arrived refugee woman and she happens to have a healthy baby, that's good. Um, but if she came to you as a doctor in the future, um, and there's no wrong answers here, but just call. So what are some of the things that you think, given what I've just been telling you about experiences of people of refugee background, what are some of the things you might be concerned about that, that you might start to, you might want to investigate with, with someone who's of refugee background? Sure, mental health is obvious one, yeah, because of yeah psychological struggles, and so and they, so it's really common for people to suffer um, post traumatic stress disorder, um, anxiety, depression, for children to have behavioural issues, perhaps separation anxieties, um, helicopter flies overhead, the kids dive under the table, that's common, yeah. Think of the kids in, from Syria now, you know, they've, they've, the Syrian war, seven years, they've known nothing but bombs falling out of the sky. I don't like it when the news helicopters go over. Yeah, did you have a... Sure, under immunisation is a big problem, yeah, because I mentioned health services and one of the first things that stops is preventive health services. So that's right. Um, that's a good point. So under immunisation, what else might, might this woman not have had because health services are, um, are disrupted? Things that you and I take for granted that, particularly women, what do you take for granted you can access? Contraception care, yeah, well women's care. What else? Say again? Survival. Correct. Screening for cancer. Yeah, breast screening, cervical screening, bowel screening if for um, women over 50. Have they ever heard of it? Possibly not. Some women from Iraq, you know, from more sophisticated countries like Syria might have had um, cervical screening in the past, but they wouldn't have had it for at least seven years, um, maybe longer. Yeah, so, so that's something to think about. So we as practitioners have to think, OK, well, what's, what's this person lacking? Yeah. On top of all the normal things you would think about for a woman of that age, yeah, about their health care, what things do you might want to screen them for, or, yeah. What about Good question, yes. Female genital mutilation, that's right. Um, so that's certainly, so as well as other sexual and reproductive health issues, um, I alluded to sexual assault earlier as being common, and so we might be worried about that as being a history. You can have someone who's got, uh, arrives with an unwanted pregnancy. Due to sexual assault or sexually transmitted infection. In fact, we don't see STIs very much. But yes, female genital cutting or female genital mutilation might be an issue. I'm going to show a slide on that in a second, but um, just some uh, stats, nothing grim. And um, uh, but it is something that we need to be aware of, and particularly in a woman from sub-Saharan Africa, perhaps, where it's uh, maybe more common. <coughs> Yes, and I, and I think it's something that we... I mean, there are some good programs and there's some very good resources for health professionals about FGM, but I think a lot of people miss it 
Um, it's probably not part of mainstream teaching and a lot of people miss it. And I think women often feel that the health practitioners are um, maybe embarrassed, inexperienced, and, um, and, 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 and one thing they hate, and a bit like what Maggie was saying, people asking inappropriate questions, you know, but also what they hate is the look of, <gasps> you know, so a, a midwife who first examines a, a woman perhaps in labour and lifts up the sheet and if they see that face go, oh, because she's been, you know, she's had her external genitalia removed when she was a small girl. Uh, hmm. So, yeah, so it's about awareness and, and sensitivity and, uh, yeah. 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 So it's depending on that. Yep, yeah, yep, good comment, that's right. Yeah, that, so that's another issue, yeah. We should be thinking about geographical issues, um, latent uh, TB, active TB, or migrants and refugees are screened for active TB before they come. They're also screened for HIV, 15 years and above. But there's some things they haven't been screened for, like hepatitis B, chronic hepatitis B, so that's a good one. Latent TB they might have, um, certain parasites, gut parasites, things like that. Not, not in the refugee population so much. Most of our drug-resistant TB is actually coming out of India, um, which has, yeah, very functional healthcare system, but you can also go to the local bazaar and buy anti-TB drugs. So, yeah. Was there another comment? Yeah. I think that 40% of refugees are screened for HCV. Good question. Uh, hepatitis C, yeah. So, um, not routinely where we screen anyone when they arrive, after they arrive here, if we think someone's at risk because they might have tattoos or have had dental care, lots of dental care or surgery, or, yeah. But we need to be screening more because, in fact, we don't know, we haven't got good data on hepatitis C. We know it's really common in somewhere like Egypt, so anyone who's been through Egypt would get tested because there's a high prevalence in Egypt. Uh, but certain other countries, we have limited data, so we need to be testing more. And that's actually, that's a good question because that's something we're, we're looking at doing right now. Would it, just to Um, it used to be, again, it's a good question, because it used to be an issue that, for example, kept people with HIV out of Australia. And it wasn't about public health concerns, it was about cost, as you suggest. So, in 2012, following a lot of advocacy from, from many, many quarters, the government made, again, a good decision, which, and they don't trumpet this decision, probably because it wouldn't be domestically um, very popular, but for, so, so HIV can still keep a migrant out of Australia because of that cost issue. But if you're coming under the refugee program that I talked about before, a health condition including HIV, hepatitis C, or you might be obese, or you might have severe liver disease, whatever it is, or disability, which is what we're really seeing a lot of, it will no longer, it no longer means that you'll be excluded from our migration, humanitarian migration program. So that's a good thing. Makes it challenging for us as providers of care because we're, yeah, we're, yeah we're, we have a lot more challenging cases than we used to have. They're much more complex. But, but you know, policy-wise, mm -hmm. it's a good thing. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, oh, look at that. So, um, yeah, so this was released all of three days ago. Um, um, and it was only looking at data um, because, you know, a, you know, a bit like Maggie was saying, it's hard to count transgender people and this is, um, it's hard to know how much... FGM exists, but this was an uh, assessment done at national level. So this is the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, AIHW, um, released uh, this. And, um, oh, what did I just do? Turned it off. Um, and it's one of these little laser. Oh, yeah, look. So AIHW. Um, so, um, yeah. So so in a two-year period, uh, this refer it's a bit confusing, but that would be a two-year, two, two um, financial years. There were about 500 um, uh, hospitalisations where FGM or FGC was recorded as an issue. Now, that's generally related to childbirth. Yeah, so it's generally women having babies. Mm -hmm. Okay? So that's just about it. Yeah. Okay, I'm just going to mention a couple of things to finish um, about, more about younger um, 
people of refugee background who are younger, and you guys might identify more with that. Um, so, um, but feel free to ask me other questions in a moment. Um, so, um, this is a study recently done looking at access to healthcare for all for marginalised young people, of whom refugee young people were one group. Yeah. So it looked at indigenous people. It looked at um, same-sex attracted people, rural and regional people, people with mental illness, I think. Um, and, yeah, so these are just a couple of the quotes from young people. Um, <laughs> no offence, isn't that great? Yeah, no offence. So, so she's obviously picked up the local vernacular quite quickly, you know. No offence. So... <laughs> Yeah, so I kind of like that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's good. And this is another one saying that, just talking about being judged. So, you know, somebody's like, I mean, a lot of negative publicity about young Sudanese men, yeah, in Melbourne, for example. So, you know, this, this female, I don't know if she was Sudanese, but I, it wouldn't surprise me if she was. Yeah. She's essentially saying, yeah. So, and so the study found about, there's often dual, you know, multiple reasons for discrimination um, um, based on those things. Um, yeah, and so the themes that came out from interviewing young people um, was that um, they end up acting as navigators because, you know, smart young people and the kids as well, they learn English, you guys, you know, you learn English faster than the adults. So you end up being uh, navigating systems. Shouldn't be used as interpreters. You'll learn about that later. But... Um, but they certainly work as navigators and are expected to help people get around the system, you know, which is complex. So, yeah, so that's a, that's a difficult role, um, but one that's taken on. Health beliefs obviously impact on whether people present to healthcare and or how they look after their health, you know, just their cultural values and beliefs about health and what makes you sick. Um, stigma with mental health is pretty universal, but it can be even greater in people from certain um, cultural backgrounds. Um, and, and the same can be said for particularly female sexualities. Um, and a good example is the, 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 the anecdotes we hear um, about, for example, a young woman, think of, uh, let's say, a 16-year-old refugee young woman who arrives in Australia. She's had her periods for three years. She's had heavy bleeding for three years. She gets pain. You really just lots of discomfort. You know, it's really, and, um, you know, First drug of choice of that is probably the oral contraceptive pill, yeah, to control her heavy bleeding. So she goes along to her family GP who's of the same cultural background, perhaps with a parent who may be supportive of that, but this usually male GP will say, well, no, you're not married, I'm, I'm not going to put you on the pill. You know, so that sort of attitude and judgment uh, denies that young woman the, the, the health care that she should be getting. So, so those cultural attitudes of health practitioners are really important, um, not just of the community. Um, but despite all that, you know, people are gratitude for the help, uh, grateful for the help that they do get, which you find um, a lot of in the health system. And this is another study um, uh, talking about um, um, and and um, family planning in New South Wales, where, where Mary Works was much involved in um, this study too. Um, and uh, yeah, so they interviewed a number of young um, migrants and refugee young people, about, particularly about sexual health and general practice. And, and so the same sort of issues I just talked about come up. Um, and most, not surprisingly, most, while it's, most people had seen a GP, but they, they wouldn't go to their family doctor to talk about something that was more personal. And that's not surprising, I suppose. So they may go to another doctor. But even when they went to another doctor, they felt that they were sometimes being judged and they were concerned about confidentiality. So, so that's, that's, a, that's a concern. Um, and they actually... F came away with negative experiences. So, so that's, you know, that's important for, for you folk and people who are teaching our, our GPs of the future and other doctors of the future that, that we make sure that uh, we're not making patients feel that way because it's, it's not what we're here for. Um, okay, so to finish, a couple of advertisements. Anyone heard of this book? Why am I telling you about it? Because this is my partner who's half written it. Um, and um, yes, welcome to your period. And um, for a small sum of money, you too can have it. So if you have, so if you know of um, someone who um, who may be female or who may not be female, as you've heard, but someone who is about to get their periods, um, 
This is a handy little guide which has just come out. Um, and some of you might listen to Yumi Steins and you might know of the podcasts um, called Ladies We Need to Talk. Yes? Well, they're fun. Yeah. <laughs> so um, I get to listen to them. It's really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Mm. I haven't finished the ads yet, yet, but I'll. Do you want me to finish the ads? And then you can ask me more questions. Okay, so that's the first ad. The next ad is tomorrow. Yes, you're all aware of this. Is it on Facebook? I hope so. So we want Notre Dame to be a sea of purple tomorrow to support young people. So it's Wear It Purple Day. Um, and it's a show of support for um, same-sex attracted or LGBTIQ young people. Yeah. So, you know, all those school kids out there who are really confused and scared and, you know, so they see lots of people in purple tomorrow. It's a really powerful signal to them that, hey, you know, there are people in the community that support you. So, yeah. Well, that was my last ad. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, other questions? So Next book's about consent, <laughs> by the way. Consent, yeah. 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 Um, they, I, I understand that with different cultures, there's different sort of um, acceptances of, uh, surrounding domestic violence and abuse. And I, I was wondering with um, the new migrants coming to Australia, is uh. there some sort of uh, education program that sort of sort of... Look, look, there is. There's a, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of resources produced for a start. And, I mean, I think, I think what the data show is that um, um, domestic violence is not necessarily more prevalent in these communities, but perhaps when it happens, women, and it's usually women in that situation, are less able to access services. And so maybe it's more prolonged or more severe or because they're not able to get out of the situation as easily. So, so, so perhaps it's worse because of that. Uh, and because of the cultural taboos about talking about it, yeah. So, yeah. So I think that's maybe where the real impact comes, because it can be a bit of a myth that it's much more prevalent in in you know different people of different cultural backgrounds. I mean, uh, but um, Mary might update you on a little bit of the data. But but um, yeah. But that's that's what my reading has been. But but yeah. But look, and it's hard to generalise. You know, it's hard to generalise. Um, so yeah, so there are resources. Um, look, similar difficult issues with uh, the way that our parents, um, uh, what's the word, um, deal with their children, you know, uh, discipline their children is the word I'm trying to think of. So, you know, now in Australia it's frowned upon to physically discipline children, whereas some cultures that's certainly uh, norm, the norm. So, so, so you run into difficult situations with parents who in some circumstances would could potentially be notified to facts for doing the wrong thing, but in fact... They just don't realise that it's the wrong thing in this in this new cultural um, community context. So they're really tr difficult cross-cultural issues that that, that occur. Um, but it is uh, you're right. It, it is about education, and we need to slowly. And the police are very you know on board, and they're very aware of all this, and they work with facts, and they work with health, and you know, there's a lot of cross cross government and cross discipline education that goes on, and, and a lot of discussions and awareness. But they're but they're not easy. They're not easy issues. Yeah. Sure. Um, so you've been sharing with us before of how uh, similar communities in Senegal uh, adopted the um, the country to be to uh, yep. that there is a lacking of sort of policy care to support the region. Mm. Very much, very, yeah, there is, yeah, particularly for language reasons. But, but again, it's hard to generalise. So some will, so some will, people will travel across the city to to find a doctor who speaks their language, and that's understandable. Whereas others will do everything they can to avoid somebody from their community for the other reasons. But yeah, so again, it's complex and hard to generalise. But um, yeah, where, where there isn't where there isn't uh, language. Um, uh, concordance, you, we need professional interpreters and there's free professional interpreting in, um, available over the phone and nationally in Australia, so that's good for GPs. Um, but, yeah, often I, I think people are more likely to seek someone who speaks their language than not. Yeah, we see a lot of that. Is there one last question? Because I've got to get... Yes? Um, so, especially if you have a lot of other yeah. Um, so ah. Yeah. Yeah. 
Why not? Yeah, go on. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, I don't want to take up a lot of Mary's time. Um, yeah, well, you know, there's there's a lot of care, there's a lot of money spent providing care, um, and, and yeah, a lot of the what we're Australian health practitioners have now been removed, and you know, uh, Save the Children Fund was thrown out of Nauru, uh, Men's Health Frontier was thrown out of Nauru. They were providing mental health care. Um, uh, they've employed a number of overseas trained doctors, I think, to to provide the care in Nauru, for example. Yeah. So, um, you know, there's care happening, but, you know, the whole environment and the whole health infrastructure in those places is not great. So however much money Australia's pouring into it, at the same time Australia's saying, well, it's not our responsibility, okay, well, you know, it's kind of a bit of hypocrisy there, um, then, yeah. So, so as you know, the Medivac bill that now exists and a lot of, a lot of refugees are being, and asylum seekers are being brought to Australia for, for care, which is a good thing, I think, yeah. We've got to get them out. We've got to get them out of there, essentially. Yeah, we've got to move on. Okay, thanks very much. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Smith. That was amazing. Thanks, guys. Thanks for coming. Um, so, guys, now we've got uh, Dr. Mary Stewart, who is a senior career medical officer for the Northern Sydney Sexual Assault Service and the Sexual Health Clinic at Royal North Shore Hospital. Mary has previously worked in reproductive and sexual health in the UK and for Family Planning New South Wales for many years in research, clinical and educative roles. She's also worked in public health in Singapore and has a Master's of Public Health and is currently completing a Master's in Forensic Medicine. Please welcome Mary. Sorry, Mary. Is it this one? No, it's not. I think it's the middle one. That one. Amazing. Thank you. Okay, thanks everybody and thanks for staying. I know it's um, had a really interesting evening already. I've learnt lots, which is great. Okay, so yeah, I wanted to talk to you basically about working with patients who have experienced sexual violence and a little bit about my work and what I do in that area. Um, we don't actually provide a domestic violence service at Northern Sydney Sexual Assault Service, but we do see a lot of mainly women who have experienced domestic violence as well as sexual assault. But in my previous role at Family Planning, we had some um, work around domestic violence, so I'll share some of that with you. I'm going to try and get this to work. Okay, so I wanted to talk to you first just a little bit about the sort of the facts and some of the um, theory and statistics, but not too much. Uh, around intimate partner violence and sexual violence. So we often use this term now, intimate partner violence or IPV, also family violence or um, domestic violence, um, also gender-based violence, these terms are all used. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the stats and what definitions are used within the statistics that we have. So this is a really good document you should have a look at that's online from the World Health Organization. And they talk about sexual violence and the fact that not only is it a violation of human rights, but it profoundly um, damages physical, sexual, reproductive, emotional, mental and social well-being of individuals and families and whole communities, um, particularly looking at a global scale. And there are factors that we know increase the likelihood of gender-based violence. And I don't think that any of this will come as a great surprise to you. But when we're talking about gender inequality, social norms around masculinity, social determinants such as economic inequality, and also problem behaviours such as harmful alcohol use. And so I'm going to talk to you at the end about a few strategies that can try to address some of these issues. Um, but this, is, this really interesting document does talk about strategies that have been proven through research to work. And one of the few things that actually has good research around it is actually education about relationships within school, that school education. Um, this is just to credit the next four slides, okay, which is an amazing research project that's just been released from New South Wales Health um, through their, um, what's called PARVAN, which is Prevention and Response to Violence, Abuse and Neglect. And they have tried to put together correct statistics around this because statistics are really difficult in this area, mainly because reporting is so difficult. We know that you know, when it comes to sexual violence, it's very much underreported. Um, and we'll, we'll have a look at a few of those statistics. But, so what we rely on, and globally, what's relied on really is population-based surveys where people are asked, often anonymously, about their experience of sexual violence to get some idea about what's really happening. So the Australian Bureau of Statistics include questions in their personal safety survey. And what they define as sexual violence 
um, is uh, for those that are aged from 15 onwards. Okay, so they say the sexual assault and the sexual threat, which is how they define it. A sexual assault is an act of a sexual nature carried out against a person's will through the use of physical force, intimidation or coercion, including attempts to do this. Um, and this includes rape, attempted rape, aggravated sexual assault, indecent assault, penetration by objects, forced sexual activity that did not end in penetration, and attempts to force a person into sexual activity, an incident so defined would be an offence under the State of Territory Criminal Laws. Now, around Australia, the laws are different in every state, so um, you know, it's, it's very complicated. A sexual threat is when there's a threat of an act of a sexual nature. So bearing in mind that that's what they're talking about, these are the statistics that we get. Okay, so when we're looking at sexual violence, so that's a sexual act or a sexual threat, um, one in nine people experience sexual violence, and that includes one in five women and one in 20 men. So it is very gendered. Um, we know that victims are most commonly women and perpetrators are most commonly men. That doesn't mean that there aren't male victims and there aren't occasionally female perpetrators, but mostly the male victims have a male perpetrator as well. And this is a good time for me to remember that because this is very common, this is something that could happen to anybody. And I know we're talking about diverse populations and these you know, marginalised populations, but actually sexual assault and sexual violence can affect anybody in any situation. Um, obviously, there are risk factors, particularly you know, refugee camps, for example, but anybody can be affected. It might be something that's affected someone in the room or somebody that you know. You may have been impacted by this. And it's um, important to look after ourselves um, especially working in this area, we have to be very aware of that. But also, if you have been impacted, then make sure that you, you, know, you, you look after yourself and you have that self-care. And the Domestic Violence Crisis Line does support um, people who want to just debrief about um, you know, health interactions within their work. So health professionals can even ring the counsellors on the Domestic Violence Line to get some debriefing and some feedback and some, um, some support. So if you come across that in your work, Feel, you know, feel like you can contact them. If it's um, something that's affected you personally, obviously there are very good supports available as well. And I've got a list at the end of the talk. So thinking this is a very gendered topic though, um, sexual assault is one in six women, um, according to the ADS data, have experienced sexual assault, and one in 23 men. Okay. Now this slide I think is really important because it's not the, the characteristics of your typical sexual assault victim um, when you look at the population data, is not what you see on TV, it's not what you see in the media. Um, when we actually look at the data, it's really interesting to see that most people are actually sexually assaulted by a male that they know, not by somebody who jumps out at them in the dark in the park. It usually happens in either their home or the perpetrator's home. Um, I can't tell you how many cases I've seen where it's been somebody who they, they live with um, or is a, a partner or an ex-partner. Most of the time there are not injuries. Okay, and this is something that's difficult, particularly for juries, in my experience, to understand that if there aren't injuries, then how can it be a sexual assault? And we know from the research that if there are injuries, particularly genital injuries, they're much more likely to get a conviction. And it's actually probably more likely that police will investigate and that the Department of Public Prosecutions will take the case forward if there are injuries, because they, they feel that you know, this validates it as a sexual assault. But we know from people who report sexual assault, it's actually only about 20% that have injuries or have genital injuries. And you can see here, sadly, only about 33% of people actually contacted a doctor or a health professional are those who actually were injured. And then it gets even more depressing when you get your police reporting. So approximately nine out of 10 women did not contact the police who had experienced a sexual assault. Um, and about 50% of women sought advice in one way or another. So obviously women are seeking advice and support in other ways, not necessarily reporting to police. And we see a lot of um, women and the occasional man who does come to see our service, but they don't want to involve the police or they're not sure if they want to involve police. And I'll tell you a little bit about how that works. Um, and this last one is around ongoing um, impacts of the sexual assault. So it says here that 57% of the women in this um, report felt anxiety or fear for their personal safety in the 12 months after the incident. So that's ongoing uh, um, effects from the assault. And we certainly see that. This is another rather depressing slide. This is the, the funnel of attrition through the, the sexual assault justice response. Okay, so we're talking about 
this idea that if somebody commits a sexual assault that they should be you know, investigated and end up in court process and, and then convicted of that crime. So it's a very flawed system and the data is really flawed as well. This data comes from lots of different sources. We don't have a, like a cohort study where we've followed through a number of cases to see what actually happens with them. We have very little data like that. Um, but what you can see here, and I won't go into all the detail, but it's pretty clear what happens. You get less and less going through the process and for various different reasons. And finally, you get less than 1% of sexual assaults against women alone resulted in a conviction. Okay. So very few actually progress to court and then very few actually get a conviction. And you can understand that. I was in court a couple of weeks ago and I'm sitting there as an expert witness looking at this jury of mainly women. I was thinking, well, that's a good thing, <laughs> but mainly women and men on the jury. And they're looking at this young guy who's done this, allegedly done this terrible thing to his flatmate. And they have to say without any reasonable doubt that he is guilty of this crime. And obviously that's going to have a huge impact on his life. So you can see that it's, you know, you really have to have a very, very good case for you to actually get a conviction. Um, the reason I was actually quite pleased that there were mainly women on the jury was because the main defence was that the DNA that we had found in this woman's vagina that was belonging to the housemate, the defence was that she had inadvertently picked up his epithelial cells from somewhere in the apartment and in the time that she went to the bathroom after the sexual assault, she has, by wiping herself, put her fingers inside her vagina and deposited his DNA in there. This was the argument that they're running, okay? So transference of DNA is becoming a really big issue in sexual assault cases, so much so that I think we're going to get to the point where if it's a household contact or known contact, it's going to be very difficult to have any bearing on DNA evidence. But anyway, that's um, very frustrating, waiting to see what the jury have decided on this case. Um, and it, it's, it is possible, but I'm thinking most of these women on the jury hopefully will think, that's certainly not the way that I go to the bathroom. So hopefully, even though the male prosecutor felt, or defence lawyer thought that that was quite plausible. Anyway, so I won't go on about the um, flaws in the justice system because I don't think anybody wins. I don't think that this guy standing up there is, you know, is necessarily going to be any the better off for being convicted of this crime either, you know. Anyway, so let's move on to what we actually do apart from the, the court cases which are very few and far between and a long time after the incident as well. That one was actually a case that had first, the incident happened in 2016, um, early 2016. It was in court last week. So for various reasons. Um, so we do a, see a variety of presentations in my work. And um, when I was asked to give this talk, they said, you know, maybe talk about one of the interesting cases you've had. But there are so many interesting cases and such variety. You know, I've had 14-year-olds who are selling sex on Instagram to people who they, you know, purport to think that they're 18, even though they look about 10, um, you know, in a car in the middle of the night around the block from where she lives. Um, you know, I, I have, you know, had women, you know, Japanese woman living here, married to an Australian man who had complete control over her and she finally decided that to, to leave. She had two children and he had told her that if she left, then she could choose which of the children to take with her. He would keep one and she could take one. Um, and they had a negotiation that he insisted that they had to have sex every week, but she could choose which night it would be. That was how much control she had over her, you know, sexual relationship with him. Um, but she finally did leave him and went to stay with a friend. And then the reason she came in to see us is that after he had sexually assaulted her, she came in to see us because she turned her phone on to see if her sister in Japan had tried to contact her. And she noticed it said, you know, your Find Your iPhone app has been activated. So he was tracking her. So she got very scared and came in. And then we get, you know, the young, young women who go out and have a lot to drink and women should be allowed to go out and have a lot to drink and then they end up being sexually assaulted by somebody who seems to think that that's okay. Um, people being driven home by taxi drivers who have had too much to drink and end up being sexually assaulted by somebody who should be getting them home safely, not sexually assaulting them. Um, or people who just don't even know what's happened to them because they, they may have been, been drugged, who knows what's happened, but they wake up and they just feel that something has happened. So we see a real variety, you know, grinder dates gone wrong. We do see the occasional male victim. Um, but I think one of the most important things that we can do and the reason that I do this work, and it's terrible to say I enjoy this work, but it's actually really fulfilling work, 
and it's something that a lot of the people on our on-call roster, a lot of the doctors do on top of their other work, so you don't have to just do this work. Um, we have a lot of people who are in general practice or in other areas of medicine and they do the on-call work, you know, maybe just a couple of times a month. And the reason that we do it is because we feel that we can make a really bad situation a little bit better in most cases. And but you can do that as well. When you're working in medicine, you will come across people who have experienced sexual violence. And the way that you respond to that can actually make a really big difference to the outcomes for them, especially if you're the first person that they tell. So it's really important to respond with belief. You don't need to ask them all the details if they don't want to tell you, but at least to acknowledge it and to do everything that we can not to re-traumatise people. Um, we do see that, um, that some people are very reluctant to have cervical screening tests done and it turns out it's because they've got a history of sexual assault. And there are things that we can do to try to you know, make sure we don't re-traumatise but we can still offer good health care. Some women will actually put the speculum in themselves, um, gives them a sense of control and there are GPs and the other health professionals who are really um, aware of that and comfortable with that and other people who just think that that would be something they couldn't let their patient do. So I think being aware that there are things we can do to make women have control and men um, in those situations. So I thought you might be a little bit interested in the forensic side of what we do as well. So I want to talk to you a little bit about that and then I'll touch on domestic violence and how you can approach that and then a few interventions that maybe help to make the world a little bit better. Um, but forensics is part of the really interesting stuff that we do. We get specialist training in this, so if you ever wanted to go into this area, um, there's a really good graduate certificate that's just part-time. You do it as, you know, while you're doing everything else that you do in your life. Um, it's really practical training, which is run for free by New South Wales Health through the Education Centre Against Violence, ECAV, and they have fantastic resources that you can have a look at too. So it's really interesting work. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to involve police reporting. We'll have patients who come to us from a variety of different ways. Sometimes they will have reported to police and then police bring them in or advise them to come and see us. Often they, they come to see us not realising they actually have an option and it's just, you've been sexually assaulted, you have to go to the sexual assault service. Um, but actually it is very much a, a choice and everything that happens once they see us is a choice for them. They have the choice of having forensic evidence collected or not, or just having medical care, or just having counselling care. We have a service which involves counsellors and medical care, um, and that forensic is just like an add-on that we can offer if they want it. They can have that done, and then we can just hold on to the evidence until they decide what they want to do, because it is very time-sensitive, um, and they really only have a very small time frame in which we might be able to collect DNA evidence. And so that can be up to a maximum of seven days, depending on what type of assault it was. But what we, we can do is then to do that process, which does take quite a while because it's very careful documentation of what they've tell, told us, any injuries they might have, and also collecting that evidence in a very careful way so that there can't be any risk of transference. The, um, the, the defence lawyer last week was trying to tell me that I, would pro I, I had probably wiped the swab across her vulva as I put it into her vagina. And I said, no, if I'd said it was a vaginal swab, it was definitely a vaginal swab. Mind you, a vulval swab that's positive for DNA is evidence of penetration in New South Wales law anyway. But, um, but yeah, it's interesting. We have to be very, very careful about the way we, we take the specimens, clearly. Um, but it is really, it's a, a good thing that we can do, that we can offer this storage. And then we tell them, look, in three months' time, we'll contact you, let you know that we're going to destroy them. If you, you, know, if you still want us to store them, let, we'll get you to let us know at that point. If we don't hear from you, then that's what we will do. We get rid of the, the swabs we've taken then. So what can it find? It, it can, as I said, you know, by taking those specimens and finding DNA, particularly if we find sperm, just DNA alone isn't as helpful, clearly, but if we can find sperm um, in the, the vulva or the vagina, then it can actually prove sexual penetration. It has to have gotten there by penetration. Um, Let's not go into the idea that it could have been her penetrating herself and transferring the DNA. Um, but it can also help to identify the assailant. But that's only helpful if we know who to compare that DNA to. So if someone says, I um, think I got sexually assaulted last night because I don't remember what happened and I've got symptoms, but I have no idea who could have done this to me, then it's very difficult for police to investigate that. The DNA that, um, that might be found on her could be compared to the database and they might find a match but it's, you know, it's much more likely to be able to identify an assailant if you have a person of interest whose DNA they can also collect. Um, we say location of assault, although I think that happens on CSI a lot more than it happens in real life, you know, finding 
pollen or something and then identifying where it must have happened. But for the first time ever recently, I did collect some evidence that I thought might help with location of assault. And this is actually a, a taxi driver incident where the woman, the taxi driver pulled over and um, in a, a car park uh, sexually assaulted this woman or some sort of an area she couldn't really describe. But she had sand over her bottom and between her buttocks. So I actually collected some of that and put it in a little jar for the forensic lab. I'm not sure whether they'll do anything with it. But it's the first time I've done that. And certainly injuries, when they do occur, can be helpful, particularly if they can tell a story. So if you've got you know, three or four bru round circular bruises on an arm and then another one around the other side, that can be you know, very suggestive of a grip mark. If you've got you know, strangulation marks or ligature marks, but we rarely, rarely see those. And actually, in life-threatening strangulation, you can often have no signs at all, no, no um, evidence of that strangulation. So, you know, injuries, yes, but very rarely are they that significant in the cases that we see. Um, what we're looking for is DNA, obviously. So that could be from semen. It can be from saliva, although we've only got up to maximum 48 hours to get it from saliva. With semen, it can be up to seven days, depending on the circumstances. Um, we may find hair from somebody else, although that's pretty rare as well, and just those epithelial cells from touch. Um, more and more people, also, I guess, sending in their samples to like the community. Yeah. Um, to, like, to For family trying to find out the heritage. Um, and can we tap into them to either find people with their relatives? No, I think that, um, that the, there's a lot of control over how those DNA samples are used and stored. Although I did hear something, you know, so I think that, you know, as far as the justice system, they don't have access to that at this stage. But, um, but apparently there are a lot of commercial entities that are very interested in that DNA. So, you know, selling their DNA or their, their, um, yes, their DNA to other, com other commercial entities could certainly happen. But I think as far as justice goes, no, they really have, um, have the, the database from DNA samples that have been sent through the police labs. Um, and then toxicology, sometimes we will collect urine or blood samples, if, particularly if we think it's a drug-facilitated sexual assault, but we have very short time frames for that. Some drugs will be out of the system within 12 hours. So by the time a patient actually comes to see us, it's usually you know, the next day or the day after that. Um, when they've sort of got themselves together and then they've talked to somebody and somebody's decided who they all found out a bit of information about which services they should access. So it's often too late to get toxicology. But actually alcohol is probably the most commonly used drug in drug facilitated sexual assault and that's usually opportunistic rather than actually drink spiking as such. This is just a, a part of the guidelines that we use for the collection of specimen sam um, specimens for uh, DNA analysis. And you can see here, if it's, say if it's an oral penetration, we've really only got about 12 hours to try to collect evidence um, to be able to get any DNA. Whereas if it's um, vaginal penetration with ejaculation, we can potentially get DNA up to seven days later if we do a vaginal speculum examination and take a sample <coughs> from the cervix. So it's very interesting work. I, if we've got time, I'm just going to very quickly go through a case study and then touch on DV and those interventions. Um, probably be about 10 minutes. Is that going to be enough? Is that right? Yeah, okay. So just very quickly to give you an idea about the sort of things that we see much more commonly than what you'd see in a TV show. 19-year-old woman Susie went to a party on a Saturday night. She'd had you know, a few drinks of wine before and then quite a bit more wine and some spirits at the party and was feeling quite unwell and intoxicated. And then she wakes up to find Rob, a young man that she knows, having sex with her. Um, he's probably drunk too. Yeah, okay, so she pretended to be asleep hoping that he would leave. And I see this quite frequently. It's this freeze response really normal and this idea that you know whatever I can do to keep myself safe is what I'm going to do right now so um, so she, she's you know tried to pretend that she was still asleep hoping he would go but he wasn't so she eventually gets up and runs out of the room and leaves with a friend and goes home and then finally comes in the next evening to the sexual assault service She'd be seen by one of our counsellors and one of our forensic examiners we have nurses who are also trained to do this work and um, and be seen with a medical care, so she might need emergency contraception, she might be very worried about STIs and need some advice around that, and she'll be seen by a counsellor who can help her deal with the immediate impacts, give her some really useful resources and organise follow-up counselling. She chooses to have a forensic examination, she had toxicology samples taken, she had an examination but no injuries were noted and had swabs taken for DNA, so had um, 
And when you don't really know, I mean, in this case, we, we have a pretty good and clear idea from what she remembers about what happened. So she would probably just have vaginal and vulval swabs taken. Um, she'd been given emergency contraception advice about STI screening, which would be done about 10 to, 12, 10 to 14 days later, and an appointment made for follow-up, which we can do or she can have done with a GP for medical care. And we would then facilitate a referral to local police if that's what she wants to do. And we were very happy to, to do the forensic examination and collection and just store those samples till she decides what to do. Okay, so she did go to police and they took a statement. Further forensic samples have been taken at the crime scene, so there is an advantage in presenting early to police. Um, her blood alcohol results showed that she was actually probably had a lot more to drink than she'd realised. Um, her blood alcohol was 0.08 on the Sunday evening, so this is 22 hours after the assault. So you can do back calculations and try to estimate how intoxicated somebody was at the time. So very intoxicated at the time that it happened. Um, no other drugs found. Semen was found on the high vaginal swab and the DNA from that semen matched Rob. Um, and the DNA was all, his DNA was also found on the sheets of the house. So the police have done all of this. This takes a long time to get all these results. You know, usually a couple of months before you'd have all those results back from the lab. Um, so police did investigate. The Department of Public Prosecutions decided to prosecute Rob. Court case went through and our counsellors provide fantastic support for people who are going through that court process as well. And the forensic examiner would give um, evidence and an expert certificate would be written with an opinion about what they've found. And that opinion is often the lack of injuries does not mean that there was, you know, that there was no, sex, no um, sexual assault occurred. And the defence was that the sex was consensual but the jury find him not guilty. Okay, so it's not an unusual pathway. Um, what area, one of the areas I'm really interested in is actually looking at the benefit of people having that forensic medical examination because there's a little bit of evidence we have to show that that can actually be really therapeutic in itself. It gives patients back power and control over their own bodies and they, they're then allowing you to examine them. That in itself can be quite empowering. So we're planning to do some research about the understanding and experience of that forensic medical examination through our service. Um, because I think that even though the justice system doesn't always serve, um, serve people in these situations, I think just being believed, as I said before, and, and having that, that counselling can be really beneficial. So as I said before to you, if you come across patients who have had sexual violence in their history or recent sexual violence, that response can be really important. Acknowledge and belief and the importance of not re-traumatising. So just touching on domestic violence, um, as we know is very common in Australia as well and got a lot of um, media attention um, in the, the time around the Rosie Batty um, incident. I think most of you probably know about that. She was Australian of the Year a couple of years ago. Terrible situation where her son was killed by his father um, and there had been a background of family violence there. And I, I think that our society is much, much more aware of family violence, but it is very common. We know that um, women will tell their health professionals, and it's mainly women, um, will tell the health pro their health, health professionals. So you may well be somebody that a woman feels that she is comfortable talking to about this. And full-time GPs are estimated to see five women a week who are experiencing some sort of family violence within the last 12 months. So there are some great resources for you to use. And the New South Wales Women's Legal Service have produced this great resource which is the, GP, the DV, DV Toolkit for GPs. And it's a step-by-step -step process of how to respond when somebody discloses or if they're not disclosing but you suspect that there's family violence. And then how to do an initial safety assessment, um, what referral services are available, how to take your notes, what your responsibilities are for mandatory reporting, and then continuing care. Um, so I think it's really important that you're aware of this resource. They're, about, they're just rewriting it at the moment, updating it. It's a fantastic resource. So when you are out practicing in medicine um, or seeing patients, then I think it's something that you can rely on to give you really practical advice and a step-by-step -step guide about how to manage these situations. When it comes to family violence or intimate partner violence, we can see it as either case finding, as with the GP toolkit that's really focusing on, say, on case finding, but there's also a system of domestic violence routine screening. And New South Wales Health rolled this out about 10, maybe only seven, eight years ago now, after doing a pilot study to show that it really does have an impact. And they do that in these services, as you can see here. So ones where we know that, you know, there's um, 
there is actually a higher rate of domestic violence amongst that antenatal population, mental health services, drug and alcohol services, and also Family Planning New South Wales as a reproductive and sexual health service um, do this domestic violence routine screening. Have any of you heard of this before? Have any of you seen it done? Yeah, have you seen it done? How was it awkward? Did you think it was an awkward process or was it fairly routine? And did you do you remember what happened? Do you remember? In an antenatal clinic, yeah. So there are set questions that are asked, and they should be asked um, once in every 12 months at least. So um, at family planning, we would have a little reminder that would pop up to say this patient hasn't had the questions asked in the last 12 months, only women, and so, and it's 16 years and older would be asked these routine questions. And we would always give a preamble, such as, you know, we know that in Australia family violence is really common, unfortunately, so we ask every woman who comes to the service some set questions. Is it okay if I ask you some questions about family violence? And that way women realise that, you know, you're not picking on them, you're not saying there's something about them that makes you think that they're a victim, but you're actually just asking everybody because it's common. And then there are set questions that are asked, and then that will trigger further questions if need be, particularly around child protection. So the first question is, you know, have you been hit, hurt, or, um, or slapped by a partner in the last 12 months? And then the second one is around whether you feel safe with a current or ex-partner. And then it goes on from there. And at the end of that screening, if it's all negative, you know, no, no um, disclosures, then we would always give a card that had contact information and further information about family violence. And we'd say to the woman, look, you know, this, we give this card to everybody. Uh, you might find somebody that you know who would find it useful. And then it allows women to know that if, they ha if they're not comfortable to disclose, then they might disclose next time they come to the service. Or they'll know that this is a place where it is safe to disclose. Or they might actually be able to give that information to somebody else who will find it useful. But I think it's a, it's a really simple thing to do, and I think it, it does actually make a difference. And we're getting quite high disclosure rates, particularly amongst our younger populations in our clinics at Family Planning. Um, and then it's a matter of what you do with that, okay? So the last couple of slides are just a couple of little short, very short videos. You may have seen this campaign. It was um, brought out last year in New South Wales, actually all around Australia, because it was a, an initiative um, from all of the federal and state and territory governments. And it was around this idea that we need to you know, change the gender norms in society from a very early age. And the campaign is actually targeting parents and teachers and anybody who deals with young people. So I'll play this very short little um, clip from one of the TV ads. And this is, the idea is about let's stop it at the start. And some of the campaign um, slogans are, you know, you think violence against women is a big problem, let's stop it when it's a little problem. So you'll see this little one if you haven't heard it before, and just pay attention to what the little girl says. <coughs> Come on then, what happened? Got detention, just for flicking up a girl's skirt. What? That's it. <laughs> Doesn't she know that's just boys being boys? Yeah, I mean, I've already accepted that as I grow up, I'll probably be harassed and even abused. Sorry. That's not what I meant. So it's a very simple, short little campaign. Authorised by the Australian that. Government, Canberra. Get rid of that. Um, and so I think it's... I try to stop it doing anything else. Um, and so I think it is really you know, a very effective campaign, though, talking about... Um, how we can change society's norms around what's accepted and that, you know, this comment, boys will be boys, just isn't acceptable and that we need to move on from that. Um, this is some media that came out around the, the murder of, um, of the female comedian in Melbourne. You may have heard about this. Um, and this was your, you know, the one that the media loves, you know, stranger in a dark park sexually assaults and murders this young woman. And the response from the police at the time um, got some really, you know, really, as they say here, it sparked a deluge of criticism. And Nina Fennell, who's a very interesting social commentator, um, posted this, which I thought was really interesting on, um, on Twitter. I would love it if the Victoria Police developed some situational awareness by realising that rape is a situation for which perpetrators are 100% responsible and telling women to modify behaviour does not make women safer but does discourage victims reporting and increases self-blame. So this idea that women should keep themselves safe <coughs> is really something that we need to challenge. 
and that you know, as the, all the women in the room, I'm sure there are lots of things that you do, lots of strategies you have that you think make you feel safer. If you're walking out to the car in the dark, you might keep your keys in your hands, um, pointing outwards, so that, you know you've got a defence weapon. And guys just don't even realise that women necessarily do this. You know, thinking about what you wear, thinking about where you're walking, um, all of these things that women feel that they, they need to do to try to keep themselves safe. It's quite sad. One of the most important things, as I said, from that report from the World Health Organization was around teaching healthy relationships. And um, I really love this one. So the last thing I'm going to play you, some of you may have seen it before. It's the consent and tea. Has anybody seen this before? Yeah. So I'm sure you'll enjoy it a second time. Sometimes it gets a bit of criticism for being maybe a little bit simplistic, but I think it's, um, it's a good, really straightforward message. So I'll play this and then that's where I'm going to leave you. Still struggling with consent? Just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my god, I would love a cup of tea, thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Then you can make them a cup of tea, or not, but be aware that they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important bit, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you're entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say, no thank you, then don't make them tea at all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. Sure, that's kind of annoying as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. <laughs> they did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind, and you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they are unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea, and they can't answer the question, do you want tea, because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea, and they said yes, but in the time it took you to boil the kettle or brew the tea and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down, make sure the unconscious person is safe, and this is the important part again, don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they are safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it, going, but you wanted tea last week, or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat, going, but you wanted tea last night. If you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you are able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to make myself a cup of tea. For any questions? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think we should look this almost at this as in the same way that we use universal precautions against infection control. Okay, so anybody could have had trauma in the past. So particularly when it comes to genital examination, you have to make sure people feel comfortable and feel that they have control. So always make sure that they can get changed in a private area, not trying to get undressed in front of you. Give them clear instructions about what you're expecting them to do, that you do want them to take off everything from the waist down or whatever it is that you need to do. If it's a breast examination, explain what you need them to do. And also to always have available a sheet to put over them so that they can cover themselves up while they're being examined and you can you know, just move it as need be. Giving them control over that and explaining to them that you know if at any time they're too uncomfortable, they can tell you to stop. And, and just making sure that it's really about that, um, making sure you're empowering women in particular, and, and men with their having those sorts of examinations in particular.
But for some people who have been through sexual violence, any sort of physical examination can be re-traumatising. So I guess picking up on those cues is really important. Yeah. 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 So, yeah, exactly. And communication is really important. And I think don't be afraid to ask. And the, you know, with the routine screening for domestic violence, the early studies showed that women actually want to be asked. And they don't mind being asked, particularly women who have experienced it. And women who haven't don't mind being asked either. So don't ever be afraid to ask. You know, whenever you've got a sense that there's something going on, don't be afraid to ask. I had a patient I just saw the other day. It was totally unrelated to this area, but I'd seen him previously, and he came in, and he just, there was something not right about him. And I just, you know, took the time to stop and ask him. And he'd actually been put on a weight loss medication that was really messing with his head. And, um, and it was just important not to just ignore that, but to actually acknowledge if there's something that you're not quite sure about, is communication is really important. Selling sex on Instagram. <laughs> yeah. And building rapport. The first thing I do when I see a sexual assault victim is ask them about the general medical health. And I think just asking those normal medical questions, have you got any allergies, are you taking any medications, and just building a little bit of rapport and, and just you know, letting them settle into that normal sort of a consultation setting and then asking them about what happened, I find really helps. Yeah, and it, often you can find out about their mental health issues before you start going into the trauma of it as well. You know, have you ever had any counselling for anything? It's actually a really easy question to ask people, and most people don't feel offended by that. You know, have you ever seen counsellors? And then if they say yes, then you can say, "Oh, did you find it helpful?" Because our counsellors might be able to help you. Yeah. I'm sure we all have to pack up and go. <laughs> any other burning questions? No. Okay. Thank you all for listening.